Let's have a word of prayer. Let's, let's pray. Yep. Lord God, thank you for giving us this time together. Bless us as we look at your word in the name of Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We're looking at Paul's letter to the Romans. We missed last week. What, um, why does Paul want to visit Rome? Because he's never been there. Okay. Paul has never been there. What are some of the things that, and that's really, what, what does he want to do when he gets to Rome? Straighten them out because they're fighting amongst each other. Well, you know, you know, John, very, that's very interesting, because if you looked at any other letter he wrote, that would be it, you know, that they are screwing up. I think that's what I said last time, too. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's I mean, that would be what he did. Romans is a little different. What, what does he want to do, in, and that's why studying Romans is kind of unique, what does he want to do in the Roman letter? Just preach the gospel. Okay, he wants to preach the gospel in Rome. That's what he wants to do. Now, the reason he wants to preach the gospel in Rome is... He's never been there. So he's he never been there. Tell him. You know, so he has no, no background. And they don't have... He doesn't have a background with them. They don't have a background with him. And they don't have much of a background with the gospel either. Well, it's, they're, they're in a unique situation. What, what makes... And I think this is really important. And I think this more strongly now than I did even five years ago when I did this once before. You know, what is it that's a big deal in the Roman church? The Jews are coming Jews. back. Yeah, you got a, a mixed church. The Jews are coming back to the Roman church. And, and that's huge. I mean, that's like the key that sort of unlocks, you know, 11, uh, 9, 10, and 11. Which, Which, wouldn't that be one of the reasons why he'd want to visit Rome because that's happening? And well, that's that's certainly in, in the background. It, it cert- I think it shapes what he writes to, and and how he writes. And one of the things that I believe, and I've always believed, it is the ninth, tenth, and eleventh chapter of Romans is the key to understanding his theology. It's not just thrown in. A lot of times you read commentators. And they say eight chapters, the key, and 9, 10, and 11 are just sort of there. And then you go into other, the epic, which is kind of typical. That doesn't make sense to me. Because as a writer, you don't, you, you save your main point till the end. Particularly Paul, because he's a plotter, he builds to sort of a crescendo. You know, his main point is at the end of his theology. That's what he really is building towards. And to say, there are three chapters that are just sort of vague, that don't, aren't really that important. To me, doesn't make any sense, you know, in terms of structure. And I don't think, I, I don't think it does make sense to say that. I think because of the context and the, the fact that we've got Jews coming in makes 10, 9, 10, and 11, it causes it to make sense. And that is his point. That's where he's moving towards. All right, so he wants to do that now. If, if his goal is to preach the gospel, and he kind of introduces that right at the beginning, right? There are certain terms that Paul associates with the gospel. And what are the words that he associates with the gospel? Righteousness. Okay, righteousness is a big deal. And righteousness is what? Okay, well, righteousness, what, what is trust? Faith. Faith and trust are the same. You know, so when he talks about faith, he's talking about trust. When he's talking about righteousness, and that's huge for Paul. Well, that's the relationship between okay. you and God. That's it. Righteousness is relationship. It's not doing right stuff. It's being in a right relationship. That's it's different. It leads than, to having grace. That's right. Well, it's connected to grace. By grace. That's right. It's connected to grace because grace is what enables or signifies that righteousness coming from God is, is represented by grace. Human response is represented by the righteousness. By faith. You know, so it's grace coming from God on that, that side of because rela- relationships need two legs. The grace is coming from God. The response is faith and faith is trust, which means you are trusting that God has done it. You know, you're not doing anything other than trusting that it's done. Okay. 
Okay, and and that's but and that's a big deal. And and the whole Roman letter is going to be unpacking what does that mean? You know, this righteousness and and faith, business. and where do the Jews fit into this this pattern? You know, these new arrivals. Okay, so we've got Paul doing that now. He wants to preach this gospel in Rome before, because he's a plotter, and he's sort of introducing himself to the Romans. He needs to establish what? What does he try, need to establish right at the beginning? His credentials. His well, he does. He establishes his credentials. Why, True. He wants, you know, why he wants to come to Rome. And right, and he does all of that. Now, remember, he wants to preach it, right? Yeah. So he needs, or at least he seems to feel as though, he needs to show the Romans that well, he knows what he's talking about. He also wants them to know that they need to hear it, right? Yeah. I'm going to bring you a gospel that you need yeah. to hear. And to do that, what does Paul establish? Not only that they need to hear, but who needs to hear the gospel? Jews. Everybody. Yeah. Jews included. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Now, to establish that, what does Paul do? We're all sinners. Okay, he <laughs> needs to establish the fact that we're all sinners. We all need to hear this righteousness that comes from grace and is made complete through faith. It's something we all need to hear because we're all separated from God. Now, how does he go about establishing that? How does he go about establishing that we're all sinners? Well, everyone is a sinner. Okay, he says all sin, or Paul, sin comes down to idolatry. idolatry. That's at the core of sin. Really? Everything else comes from that. I mean, look at a congressman. Indeed. <laughs> 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 the, idolatry. Everything comes down to idolatry. And oh, that's at the core. And idolatry is what for Paul? <clears throat> Separation. Well, it results in separation, but what is it? If, putting, if I am worshiping put, idols, what am I doing? You're putting them before God. You, you, you're, you're, True. You're worshiping the, the, creation. the creation, not the creator. Yeah. I am worshiping the creation, not the creator. And when I do that, you're moving your, the ground I, moves away the, from you. Relationships start breaking down. And when I do that relationship, and he talks about three, relationship with God breaks, relationship with nature, nature breaks, relationship with other people, other people break down. Okay? Anything, anything holy. Well, it just breaks down. Yeah. And that's the, that's the nature. That's why we have strange relationships. And Paul, now, he so idolatry is at the core. But those Gentile Christians don't see themselves as idol worshippers, right? They are... Christians. Right. So it certainly doesn't apply to them. They are no longer influenced by idolatry, right? They don't run around well, in the They don't run around worshiping sticks and bushes and stuff, right? Not. Paul says, No. No, you are idol worshippers. You, just like those guys that are worshiping that statue, you're just as bad in terms of idolatry. What? How, are, how am I a Gentile Christian, just as much an idol worshiper as a guy who's bowing down to a statue. You know, you're judging other people. I'm judging the guy who's bowing down to a statue. And as soon as I judge him, what am I doing? Being, separating, separating yourself, yourself from, from what in, in, in idol terms, in, in idolatry terms, what am I doing? The pot calling the kettle black. Why? Because you're doing the same thing. How am I doing the same thing? By judging like, them and by, you know, I mean. I am doing what? Saying you're better than them. I, I am right? holy than you. I'm holy than how, you. Is, how is that related to idolatry? Who, who, who well, am I worshiping? Yourself. You're worshiping I'm yourself. worshiping myself. I'm worshiping myself. Because I'm standing in judgment of you. And who is the only true judge of us all? God is. Okay. So as soon as I start saying, well, he's disgusting. Because of what he's doing. You know, I have put myself up as, as God. I have assumed a godly position, which means I am worshiping the creature rather than the creator. The creature just happens to be me. And don't we still all do that so much? Paul would say, 
Amen. Of course we do that. We're constantly doing it. In fact, Paul would say we can't help ourselves but do it. We know we shouldn't, but we do it anyway. He's going to say that in the seventh chapter. And he's going to point to himself. I know it's wrong, but I still do it. And I can't, it's like eating potato chips. I can't help myself. I just can't stop. Depends on which brand. Depends on which brand. <laughs> I grew up I grew up in the South. We ate wide potato chips. That was Lay's question. Which can't eat just one? Wise potato chips. I like wise. You know. And what kind of Oreo? Lay's. Yeah, well, wise. Uh, onion. Oh, it's got well, you have to eat wise because that makes you smart. Yes, well, they were always kind of brown. Those yeah. wise potato chips. A little browner yeah. than Lay's. And nice but and that soft. was okay. And greasy yeah. as all get out. Yeah. Anyway. Wonder yeah. so we got we got pagans that are worshiping idols, we got Gentile Christians that are worshiping idols, but one group certainly isn't worshiping idols, the and Jews. they are the Jews because the Jews oh, have the law, <laughs> and God they're God's people, and one of the laws says they don't worship idols. The well, Jews, they're God's chosen people. They're God's chosen and God people. Gave them the law. And by gum, they are not idol worshippers. But Paul says, no. of course you are, because you are worshiping the law. The law. The law. And how do we know, that, how does Paul know that they're worshiping the law? What does he say to indicate that the Jews are worshiping the law? Because they are judging by the law. Well, they're judging by the law. They have the law, but they're not following, following it. You know, it's they, it's like this holy book, you know, that they've got. They don't read it, they don't follow it, but they got it. And Paul says, you, you, you worship, you're doing the same thing the other guys are doing. You are worshiping the creature, what is created, rather than the creator. And that makes you an idol worshiper. So, who is an idol worshiper? Paul. Oh, Everybody. Everybody's an idol worshiper. And following Paul's logic, since we are all idol worshipers, what does that mean? We're all sinners. sinners. We are all sinners, which means what? What has happened to us? Ooh. Our relationship with, God. God is broken. with God is broken. Our relationship with nature is broken. Our relationship with one another is broken. It is a mess, right? But this will continue to happen because as long as there are people in the world, there is sin. That's what Paul was saying. Well, Paul's going to be even more methodical in establishing that. Now, he won't do it in the fifth chapter, but he will in the sixth. Uh, and the seventh. He's going to be working on sin. What, we can do with it. What, about, what, what can we do about it? What did Jesus help us do about it? Yeah, exactly. Because it's something that we can't do anything about because it's kind of who we are. And, and I, you know, again, I've mentioned it, and I want to emphasize and probably emphasize it every time. You know, we think sin is doing naughty things. But that's not how Paul sees sin. Sin is almost this pervasive force that controls. You know, it's it, if you called it another word, you could do it. But it's not being naughty. It is like something you know, else. Like it is a power. We do it. Well, it's a power that kind of grips us. And and we are enslaved. I mean, Paul we just do it. And it yeah. holds us by the shoulders. Exactly. Paul will, will use a lot of metaphor to explain it. And so, and when you deal with metaphor, I think you got to be real careful how far you push it. You know, sin is life. Sin yeah. is like a. Sin is like a. You got to be real careful because it's not perfect. It's to help people understand, but you you can't push it too awful far. Does, okay. he, does he tell you how to overcome that anyway? No, he will because not tell you, you how to overcome. It. Because you can't. Because you can't. You can't. No. Therefore, what is your condition? You're always in sin. You're lost. We're a mess. Every night We're when lost. I say my prayers, I try to count how many times I sinned all day long. Yep. That's, so, well, you, you don't have enough time. To do no, that. I don't no, have enough. No, no. I'd never get to sleep. Yes, that's being being a fine Presbyterian person. You know, we sin. As long as you're not having any fun doing it. We sin. <laughs> yeah, if I had some fun doing it, you know. If you're not lying. Yeah, that would make it even worse. But it would make it better. Uh, we sin in our best effort. We are we, we are lost. Yeah. And since we are lost, and we are, even when we think we're doing good, we're really not, because we're worshiping idols. What is the only possibility of 
any kind of redemption. What's the only possibility? Can we do it ourselves? No. no. Well, duh. We can only do it. Duh. duh. We can't do it ourselves. You know, because as soon as we try to do it ourselves, we're going to manipulate it and do what we want. You know, so no, we can't do it ourselves. Who? It has to be done through God. It has to be done through God. And that's what we kind of talked about the last time we met. And so it's got to be God acting. And we say God's action is, all of this is righteousness. God action, God's action we call grace. grace. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. our response we call faith. Okay, and that's what makes the relationship complete. Now, he's anticipating some of the Jews are going to say, wait a minute. You know, what about a word that starts with an up? Obedience. You know, you're talking about faith, that's fine. But our relationship with God isn't grounded in faith. Our relationship is grounded in obedience. obedience. In other words, we obey the law. the law. And sometimes we slip, but we obey the law. And that's how our relationship is established. Like Abraham. Well, that's very interesting. Because Paul anticipates that. Nobody says it, but he anticipates you know, that somebody is going to say, particularly to Jews or people influenced by Jews, and talking to a Gentile audience that are going to hear Jews saying it, that it may have to do with faith for you, but it has to do with obedience for us because we're people of the law. So to, for, if, if Paul lets that argument stand, if he says, okay, for the Jews it's obedience. All of a sudden, what happens? As soon as Paul says, Paul says, you're, well, you're right, it does have to do with obedience. Faith and obedience. What happens? Well, he lets the Jews off the hook. Well, one, the Jews are off the hook. Christ what doesn't happen? matter. Christ doesn't matter. The, the, the Jesus event doesn't matter. It becomes irrelevant. Because he didn't need to come. Because you could do it through obedience. No way. You know, so... All of a sudden, the whole system of grace collapses because you don't need grace if you're obeying the law. Because if you're obeying the law, you are getting what you want. deserve. You've earned it. You've got it. You obey the law and you get God's favor. That's the whole system collapses. You don't have grace anymore. Well, then, Everything changes. Then that becomes a wage, right? What's that? Then that becomes a wage, not a... That's exactly yeah. right. And wage, that's a big deal for Paul. It becomes a wage. You know, grace relationship becomes something you earn as opposed to something that you are given. given. And Paul can't let that, Paul's not going to let that go. That these are two ways to do it. You know, you either earn it or you, you're given it. He can't go there because if you earn it, then Jesus didn't need to exist. Jesus didn't need to come. Okay, now, to a, though to convince a, a Jew that it's not about obedience, Paul chooses to go away. To Abraham. Abraham. Goes to Abraham. And what does Paul say about Abraham? Yeah, they understand the Old Testament. To Gentile, that means nothing. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Evidently, it must have been, the Gentiles must have been exposed in the, the church enough that mentioning Abraham must have resonated with them somehow. Yeah. Uh, because he uses Abraham. And he uses him again later. What what does he say about Abraham that's going to support his assertion that you can't do it, it's got to be done by God? What does he say about Abraham? His complete righteousness and faith in God. Okay, talks about righteousness, right? Abraham was righteous. By the way, he chooses Abraham instead of Moses because... Why Abraham. would he choose Abraham instead of Moses as his example? Well, Abraham was the father. Abra Abraham's the father, but Moses is looked at by, by the Jews. Yeah, probably more important than Abraham. Why was he look at? Because he was huh? Because of circumcision. Well, circumcision. Remember, Moses is associated with what? The, the law. With the law. And if he uses Mo Moses as the example, the Jews will say, "Well, Moses is okay. Moses had a great relationship with God because he was a king. Duh. Yeah. You know that proves all. Yeah. Well." He, so he's got to pick somebody that predates the law. And so he goes to Abraham. And Abraham was, was chosen, was God's, was God's man, was God's person. Why? Why did, why did Abraham have 
the first genuine relationship with them? I don't know. The big God, did he accept his gift? God decided, which is we're talking about, grace, right? Did he, did he accept his gift of grace? Or rather than... what, did, what does Paul say Abraham did? God was gracious. God called. God approached. God took the initiative. God was gracious to Abraham. He completely trusted him. That's it. Whatever God said, Abraham said, okay, trust. Abraham, and they use the example of Sarah. You know, didn't, know didn't even know. argue. Yeah. You know, which isn't what it says in Genesis, but that's okay. Paul doesn't need to do that. You know, he didn't argue. He accepted. He was there, right? So Abraham becomes an example not of obedience, but an example of trusting God. Of, trusting God, of faith. And so if you're a child of Abraham, it's not that you're obedient, it's that you trust. Now, of course, the problem, as soon as you say that is, well, what about circumcision? Because Abraham was circumcised, had his old family circumcised, and that was it all. Paul says, it happened before. It happened before. Later, you know, the, he was uncircumcised when he had the complete. That's it. Paul will say Abraham was approached by God and responded with faith before he was circumcised. So, which meant the circumcision wasn't the means, it became a sign, yeah. but not the means. Which also maybe taught the Gentiles, well, if he didn't have to be, why should we be? Well, and and what Paul is interesting in Romans, Paul didn't want to deal with circumcision. Uh, because evidently that's not that a, an not issue for the Romans. Yeah. It was for the Galatians. It's a big deal for the Galatians. And he deals with circumcision quite a bit. And he makes a similar argument in Galatians about why circumcision wasn't necessary. Uh, and he uses Abraham. And more particularly, he uses Hagar and Sarah in a very interesting way in Galatians to, uh, to support a position that it's not about obedience. It's about faith. Uh, but that was an issue for the Galatians. He doesn't really deal with it much here. Okay, so he's established universal sin. He's established that righteousness is by grace claimed through faith. But there's a lot of stuff he needs to, to unpack because he's got to define what faith is. He's got to understand, define righteousness. Man, we still got this sin lurking out. And everybody in this room is guilty of sin. Therefore, how can we, how can we trust the God that we create? You know, there's a lot of loose ends that he's got to he's got to tie up, uh, or he's got he's got to even discuss it. You know, because there are problems with his position until he he kind of unpacks it a little. Okay, we're in the fifth at the beginning of the fifth chapter. Right at the beginning of the fifth chapter, what does he assume? What what does Paul write in verse one of chapter five? Assume what does he assume he has already established? We've been justified through faith. Okay, he has established the point that we are justified through faith. He used Abraham as the example. You know, we that's how we enter a complete relationship with God. Remember I told you the Greek word for that's translated justify is the same Greek word that becomes the noun righteousness. So it's the same. So instead of justify, you could say made righteous or made right because it's the exact same Greek word. It's, so it's not talking about something different than righteousness. Okay, since we are made right through faith, what do, what's the result of this? God has been gracious to us. We have responded with faith. What's now the relationship? What do we receive Peace. because of that? Peace. Well, what does he say here? Peace. Peace. Because of this, we have peace with God, right? Through Jesus. Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God. Now, how does that peace with God affect us Right now. And by the way, what would peace with God be? What would it mean that we have peace with God? Well, we're in complete trust in God. Well, that's, that we have trust in God, true. But what would peace with God? Now, go back to the first chapter. What did he say God did in response to humanity? What did he, what did he say God did? 
Used a word he's going to use later in the fifth chapter. Talked about God's redemption. Not redemption on the opposite side. Talked about God's wrath, right? Oh yeah. God showed wrath, right? And what was the wrath of God? Fire and brimstone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. What is the wrath of God? God says, "Go ahead. I'm not going to protect you anymore." I'm here. Wrath. Oh, I can hear if you need me, but I'm not going to stop it. Yeah, the wrath of God. If if I were going to show the wrath of God like to man, the wrath of Ahab to man, <laughs> it would be do it. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. You know, eat as much ice cream as you want. I'm not going to stop. Do it. But you'll but suffer. you'll have consequences. Oh, you you. I don't even have to give you consequences. The consequences are. Because we're human, what's going to happen? You'll get a stomach ache. Yeah, we're going to eat. She's going to eat like crazy. You know, I don't have. I don't have to create consequences. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to protect you anymore. You want to stay out all night? Go, go and do it. Go and do it. And I'll bet you, you're going to be in big trouble eventually. Mm -hmm. You're going to get yourself in major, major trouble. I'm not going to protect you. I'm not going to bail you out anymore. You are on your own. And, and that becomes the wrath of God. So if we have, through this new relationship, we have peace with God, what is that? why does that make sense? If the wrath of God is God taking a step back, what do we have now? God coming back in. God back in. You know, and so we've got relationship with God. Because remember, one of the consequences is broken relationship. Now we've got a restored relationship. We have a peace with God. Well, in relationship. If you have trust in him, you're back in a relationship with him. Right. Well, the, but remember, the key is always God is acting first and we're responding. Now, Paul hasn't even gotten into, well, how can a sinner ever have that? How can a sinner trust in God? I mean, if I'm a sinner, who am I going to trust in? Me. You know, because I'm an idol worship. I can't trust it. I'm not going to left on my own. I have to trust in myself. You know, so somehow that's going to have to be dealt with. He hasn't dealt with it yet. But he's going to a, le a little bit later. Next chapter he starts talking about the work and all that. But right now he's just saying this relationship is going to result in peace. And this peace is going to result in some impact right now in the present. And, and what do we have right now in the present? Faith into the grace. Okay, we have grace in which we stand, right? So in other words, right now, because we have peace with God, we know what? We have grace. God is gracious to us. Now we have something about the future too, right? <coughs> what do we get as we look at the future? It's hope. Okay, we have, we know we're in grace now, and we can have hope as we, we look in the future. Okay? So this is what, if you want to know what this peace with God does, this is what it does. Okay? As a matter of fact, because we have this hope, we know this grace right now and this hope, it changes the way we look at a lot of things, including suffering. Okay, including suffering. In fact, we can now do what in the suffering? Rejoice. Okay, we can actually rejoice. Why, why can we rejoice or boast in suffering? Why can we do that now? Why does that make, make sense? Because God is with Well, that's what it's going to produce. I'm looking at just logic. You know, as, as we're following Paul's logic, Paul is going to say, right now, because you are in relationship with God, through grace, by grace, through faith, you have a relationship with God, therefore you have now peace with God. Okay, and therefore you know about grace, you can look at the future with hope, and I'll tell you when you're able to do that, you can look at suffering in a different way. Why can I look at suffering in a different way? Why can I look at suffering and say, man, something positive is going to come from that? Because you have peace with God. Because I've got peace with God. And having peace with God means I have hope, and I, I have hope in God, that means what? Complete it's trust. It's the suffering's going to end. Well, the suffering's going to end because God's leading me into the future. He's in control. You know, logically, I, he's going to say what we start thinking about what suffering, why suffering might be good. But even before that, it makes logical sense, right? I can start feeling, I can look at suffering, even suffering in a different way. 
Because I know God's going to lead me through it to something else. You know, I, I know God is there. You know, I know I can have hope as I look in the future. So the suffering isn't an end. It's just a, a transition. And if I start looking at suffering as a transition, you know, that I am, God is moving me through this, I can even look at suffering in a different way. You know, I can look at suffering as an opportunity to what? Well, then what did he say? Because suffering does what? Suffering produces? Perseverance. Okay, it produces perseverance, suffering. Endurance. Okay, endurance. Character and hope. Okay, it produces character. You know, so all of a sudden, this suffering, I can look at suffering because I know God is, is there. I trust that God is present with me. I know that suffering is going to do something within me. In fact, in the end, it produces what? Produces hope, right? And the hope that it produces will not disappoint. Disappoint. Okay. Now, how can we be sure? Why, why is the hope that's going to come from this, this relationship, why is this hope not going to disappoint? Why is this not going to be a disappointing hope? Is it because Jesus died for us? God pours out his love into our hearts by force. Yeah, well that becomes a suffering. We, we know that because God is now involved in us, with us. And, and compare that to what Paul says in the first chapter. When he says the wrath of God is God saying go and do it. Now, not only do we have relationship and peace, but what? God comes right in. God is actually entering us. So instead of the false hopes that we may have had in the past, when we were running around worshiping idols, now we've got something that is, that is genuine. Now we've got something that is actually real. Set in stone. Okay, that's right. Well, set in, <laughs> in God, right? Now, according to verse 6, what becomes most the most clear proof that we can actually boast in this suffering? Now, notice what's, what word starts verse 6? For, which means? Guard. He's building on what he's already done. You know, most Bibles have this as a new paragraph. God bless them. It isn't a new thought. He's building on, on what he's already said. He's answering an implied question. Why can we be, what is the clear proof that we can actually feel good, rejoice, boast in this suffering that we may endure? Because Christ died for us. Because Christ died for those died who for are us. ungodly. He took the sin to the world. Well, he's not going to say that yet. I know. Yeah, but he's going to say because he died for us. Us when we were a mess. He died not when we were good or strong. But when we were sinful. He died when we were most sinful. screwed up. When we needed him the most. And, and what the irony is, when we needed him the most, and we were, when we were most sure that we didn't. Did it. When we were absolutely sure we didn't need him. That's what he got. And I had a friend who once said, I said, hey, I'm just worried about whether I'm going to get there or not when I die. And she said, well, look what David did, and look what Saul did, and look what Solomon did. And I said, yeah, but I said, I don't go by that. I go by what God says. You know, he may consider the sins I deemed bad worse than their sins. Well, I, I, and I had a, a long discussion with a man, and he's a good man. God. And we ended up closing it with, you know, him, God, and saying, you know, God bless you, and God bless you, and so it, it turned out well. But it was, we, we talked, that's what we were talking about, about sin. Uh, you know, and he was very, very adamant that certain sins are worse than others, and that these were the sins he'd overcome, and, and God bless him. It's uh, only what God deems to be the worst sin. Well, it, the, the reality is we're separated. And, and that separation is only bridged, and, and it was dealt with by God when we were most weak, when we were at our worst. 
that's when that's when Christ dies. And and Paul wants to make sure that we understand how remarkable that is. You know, and he uses something that human beings can understand. He uses an example. You know, why is that truly remarkable? That when you were at your worst point, Jesus, and we don't know what Jesus did yet. He's going to talk about that in the next chapter. Why the death of Christ is important. He hadn't talked about that yet. But he did it when we were weak, which means we didn't. We were weak. It means we didn't. No, we needed it. We didn't know it. And we sure didn't deserve it. But he did it anyway. And what makes that so remarkable? What example does he give that says, you know, this is really something when you think about it? Very rarely will somebody die for a good man, <laughs> yeah. let alone a bad one. Lord, that mercy. I'm going to tell you something, guys. I'm not going to die for any of you. You know, no offense. I like you. I like everybody in this room. But I'm not going to die for any of you. Sorry. You know, maybe my daughter. You know, maybe my wife. <laughs> but I ain't going to die for you. Debbie, you, you had know? to see the expression on his face, sir, when he said that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say it's easy to say I'm not even sure. I'd like to think my daughter, but I'm not. Unless I were in that situation, I gotta be honest, I don't know. I don't know. Do it. Well, I don't know. I, I swear I don't know. And I'm not one to say, oh, oh, do it. That's too easy. I don't know. If I'm in that place, I don't know. You know, a lot of people have said, oh, I'll do it, but don't. You know, I'm not sure that I don't have feet of clay, too. Uh, but human beings, we don't even die for good people. You know, so right. how, how does that Not play? Not unless you save them in battle. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul would even question whether a person truly is self-sacrificed. But he he kind of gives a he gives a, a, a sort of a uh, qualifies. He says, you know, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps somebody you might find somebody who dies for a good person. You know, you might look at a crowd and a couple of them would actually do this, but it ain't men, right? I, I got a question. Yes. All that. I got a question all of that. Well, you know, because yeah. when, what if, you know, it says glory and tribulations. Okay, so you have this and you got troubles and you're supposed to say, oh, great. I no, no, that's not what he's, I don't think that's what he's saying. What is he saying? I don't know. What, what do you think? What is he saying? Tell us. Well, I don't want to it. I missed it if you told us. Because... What, he, what he's saying is, and I think this is, and again, this is getting into Paul's logic. It's getting into his logic. Right? If we have peace with God, if I believe I have peace with God, it changes how I look at everything. The way I look at everything changes. Including and maybe the most dramatic example is even something like suffering. Because if I'm suffering just all by myself, you know, without any connection with God, I have no relationship with God, I am just all my own, and I look at suffering, I start thinking of suffering as what? What are some of the things that come to mind when I start That's thinking punishing. of suffering? Okay, I start thinking of, I'm being, oh, I'm worshipping my idols, I'm worshipping the God that's like me. I'm worshiping myself, and I start suffering. What do I start assuming? I'm being punished, right? Maybe. I start assuming what? That Maybe. that may be an assumption. What else? Start blaming yourself. Huh? No start God. blaming yourself. I start blaming myself. I must have done something horribly bad. There's no God. There's no God. Everything was false and empty. There's no reason. Why is this happening to me? It's not fair. You know, all of these things start coming up when I'm by myself, right? And you can even get angry with God. I can get angry. I can get angry at God. You know who else I can get angry with? I can get angry at you. <laughs> you know, because you're not helping things. You know, all of a sudden, left by myself, my interpretation of suffering is all over the map, right? But I know. I have peace with God, and I know I'm in relationship with because I've made the decision to trust it. So all of a sudden, certain things we take off the table. I'm not thinking anymore because God's gracious to me, because God loves me, and I trust that. 
I trust that God loves me. What can I no longer assume? What automatically goes off the table? Well, all those negative things you just talked about. A lot of the negative things, like God is, man, God can't be punishing me. Yeah, because God loved me before the foundation of the earth. God loves me. He's gracious to me. I trust that. I don't believe I'm being punished. I don't believe I'm being punished. I don't believe it's because God doesn't exist. Because I know God exists. The Spirit's been poured into me. I know God exists. So we got to take that off the table. I must have been really naughty. Well, I may say that may come because Paul is going to say, you know, you do dumb things. Dumb things happen to you. So I may, may come to the conclusion if I do stupid things, I pay the consequence. You know, so that may still, but I'm not directing that at God anymore. You know, I'm not saying there's a cosmic force against me now. Now, I, none of that I can consider. So now I've got the possibility of other things. Like maybe this, maybe from this suffering, I can take away what? So I might actually grow. I might take something away from it that will make me a better person. Not because I love suffering. That comes but afterward. Yeah, suffering might have some end that's going to be positive. Sort of like if I tell somebody who's going through a divorce. You know, and I'll tell them, there's nothing good. Divorce, it's nothing good. You're not going to, there's nothing good to do. Nothing. Painful, awful. Wait, wait. Unless yeah, you're... It, have you ever seen good stuff? No, it's awful. It is awful. Unless and, 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 you know, I'll tell, I'll it tell you. the circumstance. Well, but it's always when you're in the middle of it, it is awful. It is <laughs> awful. You've got an You know, it is, it, I, I'm talking to somebody right now. You know, I'll see her tomorrow. She, well, I actually got to cancel because birthday. I'm supposed to see her on Thursday. But it's terrible, you know, the divorce. And I say, it is, you know, if you think you're going to get through it easily, you're not. It's going to be painful, and you're going to be angry, and you're going to cry, and it's going to hurt, and it's awful. It's like a living death. In some ways, death is easy. Because in death, you ain't going to see him walking down the street. And you're sure not going to see him with another woman. But you may see your, your ex-husband. It is horrible. And all your friends go different ways. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, when you, when you, don't, you don't, don't lose your friends. When the divorce, you lose happy friends. It's horrible. They don't know who to choose. But, you know, right. but. There's a, in the end. There's a light once you get through this. You, you might, you're going to be a different person. And what, what I'm going to help you do is get through this so that at the end, not that you can avoid the pain, but you can't do that. That's not an option. But at the end, you can look back and have some integrity, you know, believing you did the best you could. You may have made mistakes, but at least you trusted yourself. You trusted God who was with you, you know, and you got through it. And that maybe you could look at somebody else who is where you are right now Just and like be able to say something I can't say. And, and you can say, look them in the eye and say, man, I know exactly what you're going through. Just I went my through. predecessor said, and that becomes a good thing. Everything. Yeah, but I don't believe that's 100% correct. I don't believe that is, happens 100%. Oh, I don't mean, and, and Paul doesn't say, in fact, Paul says, Paul is going to say, yeah, it, it doesn't happen all that much. You know who it happens to? Or it can happen to? It can happen to people who really believe that yeah. God is in control. That's who it can happen to. The people who believe that God is leading them, never leaves them by themselves, is always with them. They're the ones that at the end of the suffering can say, you know, there's something I got out of this, something I can pass on. You know, there's, there was so, God did not leave me. This was a punishment. There was something that, that gave, I can still have hope as I look to the future. That's what Paul said. That it doesn't happen to everybody. In fact, and it I happens to only the people that are in that relationship. When we're and even then, human beings are still sinful. So we're still people still going through it. But that's what he says. That's what peace with God changes the way look, we look at everything. And I think he chose suffering as maybe the most extreme. You know, it changes the way you see joy. It changes the way you see relationship with humans. It changes the way you see a lot of things. Everything changes. Even suffering you know, changes the way you look. So I think that's what, but Paul's point is, the change occurs when you're in that kind of relationship. And 
the relationship is done by God, and it was done by God because why did God do that? He loves us. He was giving you the gift. He loves you before. He gave you a gift. Why did he give you a gift? He didn't just give me a gift. Everybody. Well, I mean, why did he give y'all a gift? Because yeah, because God chose to give you a gift. You know. Yeah, and and what's important, and and Paul doesn't talk about it, but I think it's to be seen in the Gospels, is really this love business. Because and well, Paul will talk about it. You know, when we think about God's, when we think about love. Because we worship idols, and we assume God loves like we love. And when we love, why do we love? Why do I love Maggie? Why do I love Maggie? Because hmm? you choose to. Yeah, I choose. Why do you love Ruby? Because why do you love Ruby? Do you love Ruby the same way you love Maggie? No. Why don't you love my daughter <laughs> like you love your son? Because that's it's a different kind of love. Mm-hmm. Why? Ain't you love can't Ruby. Fathom that. You love Ruby because you. of. Ruby. Right. Yeah. I love Maggie because of, and I don't love Matt, Rudy like I love Maggie. Absolutely. I love Maggie because of She's the product of Maggie. Seed. Well, whatever. You know, if she were adopted, wouldn't make any difference. No. Okay. My love is, your love is, objective love. We love because of the object love. It comes from the heart. I, well, it, because of the object love. I love oysters. You love oysters? Oh, you're grimacing. I love oysters. Why do I love oysters? Because of the object of that I love. I love the taste of oysters. Why do you hate oysters? Because you don't like them. The, the, we love because of the object love. God, God, what, how is God, Jesus says, God is love, which means God's love isn't objective love. God does not love you because of you. He loves everyone. God loves you because of... Unequivocally. Because, yeah, because, therefore, God loves because of God. God loves because of God. God is Because God is love. God loves not because of the object love. God loves because of the subject. His love is subject-centered love. He loves because... That's what God is, love. We can't fathom that because all love is always objective. And when we start worshiping our idols, we start assuming that God loves us because of us, because that's the way we love. And so we create laws and rules and we go through all these things to make ourselves lovable because then God will love us. That's object-centered love. That's human love. God loves you because... God, God is love. God is love. Yeah, I think we're right. What's that? God's a That's it. Yeah, well, I think that's right. Agape is, is the way it's used. You know, and agape, that's a whole too, because agape is always, you know, tends to be uh, associated with verbs, as opposed to like filios, which is more a, the, the difference between agape love and filios love. You know, the, Family. The, the, yeah. the Eskimos have a ton of thing, words for snow. Mm-hmm. I read this week that there's a whole bunch of words for courage. Eskimos have like, all these words for courage. We have one. Well, I guess Eskimos are fighting bears and whales and all kinds of stuff. So they got all these words for courage. They got all these words for snow. We got one, snow. The Greeks had three love words for love. You know, eros, which is not, you know, it's a problem, but it's physical. Then they have filials, and filials love is yeah. life. I mean, that's, that's, that's perfect, life. And agape love is, is active, when we, when we, especially with Paul chose. It's chosen and it's reflected by action. Agape love is, is I, am being, I am going to be loving toward you. I may not like you. I may not like you at all. But you can love them. But I can be loved. And, and that's a God be loved. And that's when Jesus says in John, the 21st chapter of John, when he says down to Peter and says, Peter, do you love? Mm-hmm. He uses the word. And we see well, one, one word for love. He says a God. Yeah. He uses the word. Jesus says, you know, do you love me? He says, a God. Do you a God? And Peter's response is, 
Well, you know I love you. That's the way it's in the English language. Well, you know I love you. But the Greek word isn't agape. Peter says, you know, I feel you. Oh, really? Yeah. You, you know, in other words, Jesus says, are you willing to be loving toward me? Are you willing to be actively loving toward me? And Peter's response is, well, Jesus, you know I like you. I like you a lot. And Peter said, and Jesus says, that's when he says, um, um, what is it? Uh, feed my lambs. Well, now because he's going to do sheep, he says, or oh, tend my sheep. I think tend my sheep is first. And then he says, you know, again, Peter, do you agape? And Peter says again, well, you know I feel you. You know I like you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And then the third time, and this is what is so powerful, Jesus says, do you love me? But now Jesus uses it. You know, he doesn't use agape anymore. In other words, do you like me? And Peter says, you know, I've said it three times. You know I like it. And that's when Jesus says, you know, uh, or feed my sheep. Or, or he, he makes it the easiest of Because Peter won't say, I'm going to be loving towards you. He's expressing an emotion. He's not, express, he's not dedicating himself to action. And finally, Jesus says, you know, I'll take the emotion. You know, I'll take the emotion. And this yes. is after the resurrection. And this is after. I, I still got a little, little. Let's take you use Rudy as an Good. example. Say something happened to Kayla, right. Eric, and you were to adopt Rudy. Yes. I think after a short time, you're going to feel about Rudy the way you do feel about Maggie. So is not that change? Oh, sure. Right. Okay, well, so, so, sure. But it's, but why am I feeling about Rudy now? Because he's their son, not yours. Oh, well, well, right now. But if he comes into my house, if they and and I raise him as my own, and I come to really love him, why am I coming to love him? He's yours. Because he, yeah, because he's yours. Because exactly. He's but but yours. notice what you said. Because he he mm -hmm. because he I don't love. I'm not going to love him because Ed Rudiger is love, and Ed Rudiger just loves everything. Right. You know, Ed Rudiger loves Rudy because now Rudy's in my home. Now I'm raising him. Now I'm feeding him. Now he's like my son. And so I'm going to love if If Debbie were to die, if, well, if Debbie were to die and I remarried and the, my, my new wife had children, you know, I would hope I would love those children. Absolutely. You know, I, would, I, might not, I might not love them as much as Maggie. I don't know. Maybe I would. I have no idea. But I know I would love them. But I would love them because they're my stepchildren. I wouldn't love them because I love all children. You know, I love all children equally. Baloney, I don't love all children equally. No. You know, I love certain children more than others. Because I can't. My love is always object set. God's love isn't. God's love is subject set. It's focused on himself. You know, therefore God can love you as much as he loves me. And and that's and that's God, I'll go even further. God can love you as much as he loves me, as much as he loves me. Joseph stop him in the yeah. You know, because it's not about Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Yeah. It's about oh God. 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 It's about God. And that's why when we worship idols, we start putting God in our framework. We start defining God by the terms that apply to us and the concepts that apply to us. And that's what he called the saying. We gotta break ourselves from that. You know, that's what we need to get away from, because that's idolatry. And guess what? I'm going to do it later tonight. Later today, I'm going to start. To, I'm still going to define God in ways that I can understand, which is going to be very human terms. I'm going to do it, which means I am what? I I'm still a sinner. Mm -hmm. I still worship him. But you know what? God still loves me. You know, God's the good news. God's God still no matter what. Yeah, and Paul will even get into that. Okay, so we got we got Paul. We got peace as we do it. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me find out where, where I... Where. We are enemies of God. God still loved us. Uh, death of his son. He talks... When we, when we get to verse 10, uh, well, even verse, verse 9, uh, he's, he says, God loved... Christ died for us when we were rot, right? Right. Uh, with that being the case, then... What can we, we can start making some 
maybe some assumptions. If God loved us and somehow the death of Christ makes a difference, and that death he introduces in verse 8, but he's not going to develop until the next chapter, what that means. If, if Christ died for us, what can we assume that he talks about in verse 9? What might be a reasonable assumption? Redemption? Because okay. I think that's he, what it said in King James. Okay, we're talking about redemption. That we are going to be what? Justified. Saved right. from, from the wrath of God. Which simply means since the wrath of God is separation, we can assume that God's going to, come God's going to be close. Well, he's already said it, the Spirit enters us. So we can assume that wrath of God has ended, that God is going to be, be close. Really interesting, he introduces an, a word that we haven't seen before. And he, he talks about saved. But what tense does he use? Past tense. When he says saved. Past tense. Now, verse 9. Much more saved. surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, Correct. will we be saved through him from the wrath of God? That's not past tense. That's what? Past oh, present will be saved. That's future not even tense. present tense. Future future tense. That's future tense. Future tense. Because what we're going to see is for... For Paul, salvation is future. Uh, so Paul is never going to say, you were saved. Again, it makes logical sense for Paul. If, if, I, if I went to Paul and said, I was saved. I was saved in 1974. Paul would say, saved from what? What? What, what were you saved from? Sin in 1974? I think you've sinned since 1974. Saved from death? I bet you you're going to die. Save from pain? No. Save from... You, no. When we weren't saved, we will be, will be saved. And salvation for Paul is something that comes in the future. So, I mean, that's, but that's for other, other writers in the New Testament that don't, don't do that. They just use the word in a different way. All right. Now, what, what does... How does Paul rephrase this... This idea in, because again, verse 10 starts with the poor. What does, what is God doing? What has God done according to verse 10? He's reconciled. Okay, he's reconciled. New word, reconciled, we haven't run across before. You know, that we are reconciled with God through the death of his son. We don't know how yet. He's going to explain it. Much more surely, will we, have, having been reconciled, will we be Saved by his life. Again, this is a future tense. Now, if we just take this before we, we get into verse 12, because verse 12 he moves in a slightly different direction. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. What what has Paul established at the beginning of chapter 5? Just in, in in one or two sentences, what has Paul established? Gone to a lot of detail stuff. What has Paul established in verse chapter, beginning of chapter 5? That he hadn't done before. Peace. Okay, peace in particular. What kind of peace? What God, peace are we talking about? God's peace. Peace. Okay, we've got peace with God. Peace with God. Okay, and and if Paul had just said we got peace with God, that would have been enough, you know. But Paul Paul never does something simple. It's always long, <laughs> you know. And that so that's his point. We have. You know, he's talked about righteousness. Peace. When you're in a righteous relationship with God, you have peace with God. And because you have peace with God, what does that mean for you? You have hope. You have hope. And you look at the world in a different, different, different way. way. You look at the world in a different way. Because nothing is the same. Food tastes better. Pictures are right. Oysters taste better. Oysters taste better, Susie. Shows your relationship with God that you don't like. It. Oh, crap. Oh, blue crab. Nothing better on earth. All right. So, we've got, we've got peace with God, and that peace with God is going to make a huge difference in the way I look at the Word. And why, do, why does God give us peace? Why does He do it? Because He loves us. Because He's God. God gives us peace because He's God. Yeah. God. And, and somehow it's related to the death of Christ. But Paul hasn't explained to us how. He has just dropped this in. He's going to explain that later. What the death of Christ, why is that leading to what he's established? But right now, peace with God. Now, in verse 12, what does Paul talk about in verse 12? 
Now he's going to start talking about, because the problem, the elephant in the room is still, how can a sinful person have faith in God? Because a sinful person is going to have faith in a little g God, which is an idol. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what a person on his own is going to have faith in. So to say to somebody, you need to have faith in God, you're telling them to do something either they can't do or they think they're already doing, but they're doing it towards an idol. You know, they're doing it towards an idol. So some sin is still this problem. So he's going to start working on what, how is sin going to be resolved? Because you can't have faith while sin still has absolute power. All right? Verse 12. What does he start talking? How does he start talking about sin? In verse 12. Well, he talks about Adam, but he doesn't Okay, now Adam. he's going to talk about Adam. The original sin. That's right. Well, he says even with it, sin came through one person. And what came along with sin? Death. death. Okay, so sin and death for Paul are related. related. Why are they related? Sin only stops when you're dead. You don't bet me. Well, I've had you for class. Oh, yeah, I've said that before. That is exactly, I think that's exactly <laughs> the point. You know, I would say, whoa, that's really good. I think that is exactly the point. You know, that, and we're going to see it later. The, the death for Paul is not a bad is it not bad? In fact, death is part of what God does to fix sin. You know, because dead men tell no tales. There are two things that dead men dead men don't wear plaid. <laughs> dead men don't wear plaid, and dead men don't wear sin. Sin because they're dead. Hey. You know, sin or sin, remember, sin isn't an action, sin is a force. You are finally free from this force of sin by dying. I've you know, talked to people about it. It's like with AIDS, you know, it, now we can treat AIDS better. It was more dramatic about 15 years ago. You know, that we could destroy AIDS in every human body. I mean, that was easy. AIDS is, as a virus is really pretty, AIDS is pretty delicate. I mean, it can't live out in the air. It can't, you know, it's, it can only survive in fluids with certain conditions. AIDS is a pretty delicate virus. It is not hard to destroy AIDS in any infected body. It's really easy, in fact. There's just one little problem. What's the problem? You've got to kill the person. You know, if you kill the person, you can destroy the virus. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really easy. Hey, I've got a question to ask you along the same lines here. Yeah. Uh, you, you have plaid. You have plaid. Jackets, yeah, I do. So, when you pass off from this world, is Debbie burying you in the next in line? You know, and you, know, you, know you know, John, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I have all these things that I would like Debbie to do because part of me needs to be in Virginia. Soul. I know, we know that, yeah. Uh, part of me needs to be in Virginia, so but you know what. Debbie's going to pretty much do with me what Debbie wants. <laughs> and, and well, sure, he does not. I'm going to have one sale. You know, well, I'm not, I, and, and you know something? Before, before I, I depart this mortal toil, I hope I say to my dear wife, you know, dear wife, Whatever you do need. what you need. Yeah. You it's know, if, if the idea of cremating me you can't handle, don't cremate me. Yeah. And putting me in Virginia soil or something, me being separated, you know, don't worry about it. The only thing I ask, darling Debbie, the only thing I ask, so because if I, if I die here and she does agree to cremate, I've already got told you, I've already talked to John Grieco, there's going to be a U-Haul in the funeral procession. You know, because she is headed to Indiana. She is going to be going to Indiana. If I am cremated and she is headed to Indiana, Either don't roll down the windows or make sure my urn is, is tight. Because I don't want to be spread across the state of Ohio. <laughs> you know? The state of Ohio. There's nothing wrong with Ohio. I just don't want my remains. You want them to go to the time. I don't want them to be floating through Columbia. Through Columbia. You don't want to be in the board, Bill. You want to be... I don't, I don't want to be in Ohio. Ohio. I don't want to be in Ohio. But I don't want to be in Ohio. I want to be in Virginia. You want to be in Virginia. Yeah, I want to be in Virginia. All right. Now, all right. 
So we've got through one way establishing something about saying one man said sin came into the world and death, so he's established this, kind of pushing his argument. Now, what is the really what relationship does Paul see of between uh, sin and law? You mean worshiping the law? Well, I mean, the problem is somebody's gonna say, Paul anticipates it. Oh, you know, so he says, oh, I'm going to talk about sin. Sin, sin was, entered the world because of one man. Sin was here before law. Sin is going to be here before law. What else was here before law that he said? Sin's here before law. What else was here before law? It's going to be after law, too. Well, it's going to be after law. What, what was before law and after law? Go Righteousness ahead. was before law and after law. Right? And grace, which was... Yes, and grace was before. Faith was before. It'll fall through eternity right. where sin goes with me. Yeah, sin, uh-huh. sin was here before, so sin predates the law. What is, what's the problem, what, what, how did the law change sin, what did the law do? If, the, if, if sin existed before law, which means sin is not doing naughty things, because remember doing naughty things, we don't know we're doing naughty things until somebody says, don't do it. You know, as soon as somebody says don't do it, and we do it, then we're naughty. If nobody says don't do it, then we're not naughty. We may be stupid, but we're not naughty. You know, and so, but he says sin isn't doing naughty things. You know, sin predates, just like righteousness, predates the law. Well, what's the, he'll talk more about the relationship between law and sin, but right here he wets his beak and says, what's the relationship between law and sin? How did law change things? If sin was here before law, what difference did the law make with respect to well, sin? Didn't it say you can't have sin without the law? Well, Paul said right here, yeah, you can, because sin was always here. And logically, if I sin and death true. are together, right? If you <laughs> sin and death are together, how can we be 100% sure there was sin before the law? Because you died. Because there, Mo, Abraham died. Noah died. Adam died. Everybody died before there was all. So there must have been, for Paul, there must have been sin. Well, and because there was death. And sin doesn't mean, like you said, doing my thing. Sin That's means right. you're out of a relationship with God. It, yes. And that has nothing to do with law or. That's rules exactly. Or the only thing that sin did with the law is, as soon as the law came in, it he says it. it was now reckoned against you. Which means now you can keep score of how, you know, all of a sudden you did not. And that's because of sin caused you to do naughty things. But the naughty things aren't sin. Right. Sin is what causes you to do the naughty things. And the, the law said, okay, here are the naughty things you're doing. So all of a sudden, it started being counted against you. But it didn't mean that sin didn't exist. Sin was always there. You know, Even when we didn't know it, it was still there. Can be sure of that because people died. Died. And so he goes back to death in verse 14. And what was the reality between Adam and Moses? They all died. People died. Which means what? There's, well, there's you there's had to have sin. sin. You know, you had to have sin. But they sin. didn't have it after they were dead. Okay, that's right. Adam. Now, it's kind of interesting that he says one man Adam. Now, we kind of think of Adam as a property. You know, guy going yeah, down the street. Yeah, but told him to eat the apple. Yeah, I, said, oh, I know it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it was obvious it was her Because women, you know, Adam was just so happy. Well, I don't want to get it. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, she put it in a pop over. He didn't even know what he was eating. Uh, the, uh, uh, anyway. Anyway. That's that's when you read Eugene uh, Peterson's message. It's a pop over. Anyway. The, uh, uh, no, actually, Eve resists. Ten, you know, when the devil, it, it, the serpent, at least she responds and sort of argues with him a little bit. You know, she just gives it, it just says, she gave it to Adam and Adam ate. Yeah. So it, it, Adam says, okay, you know, here it is. Oh, oh. We'll not argue with him. You know, because they'll eat anything. You know, I don't want to have a catch. Uh, the, uh, but, but with Adam, we tend to think of it as a proper name. The Jews didn't see it as a proper name. Doesn't that mean uh, or something? Adam, Don't you tell us that? Uh, yes, I do. I, 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 Adam, Adam. Well, I remember what he does. Yeah, that's really good. Adam, Adam means means human. Adam, Adam in Hebrew means human, and it means human because Adam 
was the one from the Adama, and Adama is dirt. So Adam is the one from the Adama. Now, so so if and it's interesting when you read the Genesis, the second creation story in the second and third chapter of Genesis. If you read it, every time you see Adam, if you sit, think or even say out loud "human," boy, it changes the whole meaning of the story. Because instead of it being the story of one person, all of a sudden it becomes the story of Mankind. humanity. It becomes human, the human story, and I think that's just what it's. It is the out of the story is our story. It's not the story of a person. It's the story of all people. And in a sense, Paul kind of claims that, and he does it here, he will do it in First Corinthians, uh, that Adam isn't just an individual, but Adam is kind of a representation of humanity. So Adam, sin entered humanity because we are all, in a sense, sin. well, in Adam. We are all in that. We are all at it. And therefore, we are all sinful. Now, how did that happen? The devil made us do it. No, no, no. Paul doesn't say it. Because for Paul, that's not right. You know, why, did, why are we sinful? I don't know. Paul's saying we just are. You know, he doesn't say it. We're sinful because of this. It's not right. We're, that's just what we are. We are just sinful, just like Adam was sinful. He doesn't won't say, well, Adam just made and that was the root of sin. Because what Paul's already said, the root of sin is what? Idolatry. You know, so he's not going to get into this disobedient business. Again, we are just plain sinful. sinful right? So apparently he's going to go for the, pos the positive rather than the negative. Now, if we are all in Adam, and he'll say that in 1 Corinthians, also say it in 1 Corinthians 14, when he talks about the resurrection. We are all in Adam. Paul introduces in verse 15 another person. If we are, if one person, Adam, kind of encapsulates encapsulate all humanity, because we all die in Adam, we are all sinners like Adam, who does he contrast that with in verse 15? Jesus. 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 The one man, Adam, the one man, Jesus. Jesus. And he'll say it. The Redeemer. The one man, Jesus. For Paul, the incarnation is really a big deal. Because in Adam, all people are sinners. In Christ, all people are forgiven. Boom, baby. Yes, ma'am. That is exactly right. All of a sudden, they become, you know, human representations of humanity. The one man, the old man, and the New man. And that's for Paul why the incarnation is so important. You know, that Jesus is the new, is the new man. That in this new man, everything, everything changes. Okay. Now, Adam's sin, what is introduced by this new man, Jesus? What enters the picture of Adam? What enters the picture with Adam with sin? What enters the picture with this new man? Redemption. This Jesus. Okay, what, what's the gift? What is introduced into the world through the new man? Righteousness. Righteousness by what? Faith. By the life of one man. By the life Grace. Of one. Grace is introduced through the new man. The old man is sin. The new man is going to be grace. In other words, the new man does what? Corrects what happened exactly erases what the first one didn't work or had issues. The new one is going to is the correct. The sins of the world. That's right. It's going to be the new Adam, the new Adama from the Adama is going to correct what happened. And the grace, and that grace is what? Described as righteousness. A gift. Gift, which means yeah. it is not. A wage. A wage. It, is not earned. Yeah. It, is, it is not earned. It is something yes. that is freely given. And given to whom? Everybody. To yeah. us. Everybody. And, and what is the effect of sin? How does the, what's the difference between sin and grace? Eternal life. Grace runs to eternity. We can't. Well, true. But what does Paul say? What's the fundamental difference between 
the sin that was introduced by Adam and the grace that is introduced by Christ. There was condemnation, the condemnation for all men through Adam. Boom. Condemnation. All men are lost. We know they're lost because they all die. That means all people are idolaters and they all end up dying because of that. That was introduced by Adam and affects every human being. Period. What is introduced by Christ? Righteousness. Righteousness that brings life, life for all men. What did you say? Eternal life. Brings what? what mine says life for all men. Yeah, mine does too. Mine said eternal life. It, it says one so act of Jesus righteousness was justi was justification that brings life for all men. Wait, 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 eternal wait, life by Jesus. Wait a minute, let me read it again. So this can't, this can't be read. It's the second of Okay, oh, I was reading 18. Yeah, because I was looking at 18, too. Read 17. Yes. Last sentence of 17. Okay. I'm going to 17. Uh, and I'll read 17 and 18. If because of one man's transgression, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Uh, 18. Uh, therefore, just as one man's trans, uh, trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification in life. Justification. That's, it's, that's got to be a Because it says what? At the end. 18 says, Mine reads so just one like man's that. act of righteousness <laughs> leads to justification. Must be a bad trans and life mm -hmm. for What does your say? Mine yeah. says what yours says. So oh, for all, what does yours say? All men, oh gosh. You've got all people? Anybody get? No, 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 no. But it's not, can't be for all people. Because that, it can't be for all people, right? Because certain people aren't, it's not for certain people, right? No, no, everybody. no it's for all, everybody. Really? All men. <laughs> yes. All men. Boy, I'm going to change a lot of things. You know. Am I wrong? It says all people. I, I thought it was only for the good or for the righteous. Or those I thought it was only for the men. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'll tell you something. I think it was only for the good. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to write. I'm going to say, but. Oh, this is always good. Therefore, just as one, just, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all, but not everybody gets it. Okay, but. And then I'll, I'll fill in the rest later. I'll have to leave your Bibles. And I'll write that in all your <laughs> I just think it's for the men. The, um, yeah, just for the men. <laughs> it does say man. Um, <laughs> now, this is, this is really interesting. Because what Paul logically, this is what Paul has to do. I mean, he can't logically come to any other conclusion. If we are all in Adam, and that leads to condemnation, and this is actually a free gift given by God, he can't turn around and say, this is a free gift given by God. But some of you don't get it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't go to some of Yeah, and who gets it? Well, the people get it are the ones who God's choice. Because they've done certain things that you haven't done. He can't do that because that's going to under, that undercuts his whole, his whole argument. And as soon as he does that, grace collapses. Yeah, and God never breaks Why? Wow. This is, this is really powerful stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise because when you leave here, go to the end of chapter 11 where I think Paul s summarizes his theology at the end of 11. And after, right before he gets to the doxology, and he ends with the doxology, read what he writes. Read the last bar clause. Not all that far from what he's saying here. But for Paul... What's that? Sorry, I'm no, I was moving off. What about Peter's keys to the kingdom? Well, for, we're, right, right. That's bugging me. What about yeah. what? That's the, and Peter, Peter's keys to the kingdom. Uh, in wow. <laughs> no, that's that's good. It, that's a Matthew. That's yeah. a Matthew. Uh, the. Um, yes. Yeah, right after, well, you know, in, in, in that confession, confession of Caesarea Philippi that Peter makes, in, in Matthew, it's, 
it, it, it's more dramatic because Peter's confession is uh, you're the son of God. So it's not you are the Christ, like in Mark. It is you are the son of God. And then he has this, where you, to you, you the king, you the king, you know, what he's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Um, and, and, I, and I think, I, I think as Matthew shaped to Paul and Peter well, I don't think, but I, I really don't know that it's, it's related to, to this. this. Well, but I, I, I was, what, what Paul's going to say, and I think this is really important, and one of the reasons that I'm Presbyterian, a Reformed Christian, and not uh, another kind, including, you know, Methodists, Methodist. even the other Protestants, is, is because, of, because of stuff like that. This is what, what Paul is suggesting, I think. And, and if he said it once, you say, well, maybe I've been straight. But he doesn't say it once. He says it a lot. You know, he uses this a lot, uh, this image a lot. And if you're reading the end of the 11th chapter, he says it, so God may be what? Merciful to who? All. Uh, the, uh, what he's consigned us all to disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The, uh, what, what I think he's, what he says is, when it comes to that ultimate, you know, that ultimate salvation, which is for all of us in the future, you know, that's in the hands of God. That's in God's hands. And you don't worry about it. There's nothing you can do right now that's going to change that. Not. Now, there's a lot you can do to change your life right now. And you can choose whether you're going to live in the light of that now or not. And that decision has huge implications. And they'll talk a lot of that's what happens after chapter 12. You know, there's a lot of implications if you live as though you believe this. If I believe that God, that this is, that we're all redeemed in Christ, that's going to change the way I live right now. And that's what Paul says. It, it takes destiny out of our hands. And that's probably a good thing. And what it does is say, instead of focusing there, focus here. here. Focus here. Yeah. Because yeah. this is what you can do something about. You can't do anything about that. That's all we party in God's hands. You focus here. And, and I think that's calling theology. Uh, and, and that's what I think you know, Calvin wrote, how Calvin interpreted it. I think that's how Karl Barth interpreted it. I, I think this is consistent with what historical on theology is taught. Uh, I, I think they are all full of that because they, I mean, when you don't need a reprobate group. <laughs> but you don't need it. I guess you could put it in there if you want it, but you don't need it. It's the sovereignty of God that becomes important. That's what's being testified here. You know, it's God is sovereign. And logically, it doesn't make sense for God to pick and choose, you know, who's in it. You know, we that are all, you know, we're all in Adam and we've got to be all in Right. We can't all be an Adam, but some of us. Then why some and not others? So it, I think Paul is fairly consistent. And in fact, he kind of explains it because he, he does another dark sentence <laughs> in, in verse 19. What does he say? One man is disobedient, <laughs> many were sinners, and one shall be made righteous. One yeah. by one man, everybody should Say He uses the same word. You know, many, many. So everybody who was by one man, this speed as many were made sinners. Well, who was made sinners? Oh, Everybody. So, you know, again, we got this parallel. This same parallel thing. Now, when we still got, so, establishes sin somehow through Jesus. We don't know how yet. But somehow through the one man, Jesus, sin was taken care of. One man introduced it. One man solved it. We don't know how he solved it. But he did, for Paul. He did right here. Okay? We still have lurking in the background of the law. What does Paul say? And this is just a little excursion, although he's going to develop it more in chapter 6. And what does he say in verse 20 about the law? It says the law entered and offenses abound. Tre Tre the, the trespasses. Moe. didn't say sin grew, but the trespasses. And what's the trespass? Sin. But, well, it's a... Violation. The, the trespass becomes signs of sin. When the law came in, the trespasses, the signs of sin seemed to increase. Why did the signs of sin increase? 
Because they were pointed out. They, yeah, they were pointed out. I don't know that I'm doing anything wrong until somebody says, you're wrong. And now I know. You know. But as the trespasses increase, Grace. what also increases? Grace. Grace increases. You know, so as the trespasses increase, which, which means what? They were working we hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, the gift is coming from God. And you know, we got... Endless of... Uh, yeah, yeah, we got worse and worse. But you know what? God God's more grace more. got more and more. bigger and bigger. It was always, no matter how bad humanity got, you know, grace was always something, was always sufficient. Now, Paul's going to have to deal with the beginning of the sixth chapter. Some bozo in the back of the room is going to raise his hand and say, and we've had any teacher, teachers, we know these guys. They're going to raise their hand and they're going to say, well, Paul... If grace increases as sin increases, shouldn't I sin even more so that more grace is there? Isn't grace good? So I can increase grace by being really bad? You know, and Paul's going to say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know, that's just plain stupid. I promise not to say it then. But some, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Would you, what, did you promise not to say it then? Because she's a teacher because I'm Oh, yeah. Yeah. that was. But every teacher knows somebody in the room is going to ask a stupid question. You know. You know what I mean? uh, teachers to ask. It. Yeah, I used to tell my kids, "There's no such thing as a stupid question. Stupid no, answer. just stupid people. Right. <laughs> you know. And there are some real stupid people hanging around the back of the classroom. Most of my kids will ask questions. <laughs> I didn't think yeah, it was most most of the questions are stupid. Yeah, There's a lot of stupid questions at. Right. You know, they, they know they they want to get you off topic. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, and that's okay. all right. If we look at chapter five, five, what's the bottom line? Peace. Peace. We got peace with God. What do we got with sin? We have peace with God that changes everything. We got a sin problem, right? How does sin enter the 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 play? The story. Through Adam, through As Adam. sinners through Adam, we know what ended with Adam because what else came with Adam? Death. 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 But somehow the second Adam, Jesus. Jesus dealt with sin. And somehow that gift that God gave through Jesus was sufficient to cover sin, even when the law made sin look even worse. worse. Even though the law makes sin look even worse. Now he's going to say, the law isn't sinful. The law, you know, it's a lot of stuff he's got to talk about. Because people have made dumb ideas about it. But the, even though the law made it look worse, God has always, always got to do it. Since okay. Adam and Jesus seem to run parallel here. What's that? I said, since Adam and Jesus seem to run parallel here. Sir. Why is Jesus the Son of God and Adam wasn't the Son of God? That's what makes it different. That's that's why Adam that's why Jesus creation. is going to be is going to be different because Adam Jesus is going to be because Jesus, remember Jesus isn't the, a God man mm -hmm. or even part God part human. But he was sent by God. God, well, not even sent by he, God. He was, Jesus. His, he is God. through the womb, God. and Adam was just made. Yeah, well, Jesus is God. And that's that car incarnation becomes really important. Only, only Jesus, who is 100% God, 100% human, mm -hmm. in this kind of a mystical, unexplainable yeah. way that we can't, I can't get my head around. But only somebody like that that could completely identify with humanity, but also completely identify with God because he is God. And he is human. You know, only that person can do what Paul is going to say in chapter 6. He did. You, you have to have that incarnate God to do it. It's not, it couldn't be done by a new Adam from the Adama, into which God breathed his spirit. It, that's not, because that one is going to do just what the old Adam did. Is going to start worshiping idols. Only, only the new Adam can change it. And we know that the new Adam, and this is what Paul's going to go for. We know Jesus takes care of this because not only does he die, 
which shows that sin was there, but he rises. He rose. And and that's going to be a big deal. You know, for Paul, that's a, that's a big deal. It's not just the dying; it's going to be the resurrection that's going to make a make a huge difference for the apostle Paul. Something that Adam couldn't do. Adam couldn't do. You know, but Jesus could. Okay. Does it make sense? Paul is tricky. You kind of have to get the logic. If you're not, if you're kind of hanging in there, that's okay. There's another. Just go home, think about it. Because there's a logical flow. It all makes sense, but you kind of have to take the steps. But it makes me feel a lot better. It sure. I don't know why it did when we did this before, but all of a sudden it. Finally, something to this. Well, good. This is, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Betty, this is good news. This is, there's a lot of stuff that's called good news. This is good news. You know, this is really good news. And Paul knows it. And that's why Paul wants his people to hear it. You know, that's why he wants them to hear it. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much for reminding us of, of your word, your grace. That it's, it's a gift, something that we don't deserve, that we didn't earn, that we can never earn. Uh, help us to see it as a gift. And help us to trust that we are in relationship with you because of what you did. And then enable us to look at our lives in, in different ways. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.